lift off. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us on our lunchtime webinar for Optimising Your Abstract. With State of the Art 2022 not too far around the corner, in Belfast, the 28th of June until the 1st of July, the deadline for submitting your abstracts is slowly creeping up on us. We know there's absolutely loads of excellent projects being carried out within the ICM MDT, and this is such a great opportunity to showcase all your hard work. So we'd love to see abstracts submitted from as many as possible before the deadline of Sunday, the 27th of February. There are so, so many different ways you can present your work. So please do check out our website, soa.ics.ac.uk for some more details on this. This afternoon, we're joined by two brilliant speakers, we have Dr. Bronwyn Connolly and Dr. Shagan Olyusanya. Dr. Bronwyn Connolly is a critical care physiotherapist and senior lecturer in critical care at Queen's University Belfast. She is currently leading the NIHR HTA funded MARCH trial, which is investigating the effectiveness of mucopurulent agents in acute respiratory failure. And she's also one of the ICS directors of research. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I hope you've been having a good day so far. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to be here and really looking forward to talking with everybody about your abstract submission. So thanks again. Lovely. Thank you. And Dr. Shagan Olusanya is one of the longest serving ICM registrars in the UK and currently works at Guy's St. Thomas's Hospital. His interests include point of care ultrasound, social media and well-being. So I have to ask, Shagan, have you submitted your abstract yet? Um, my excuse for not submitting an abstract this year is that I'm a member of the State of the Art Organising Committee and I'm being a significant part of the POCUS course. Um, so, yeah, that's my reasons for not doing so. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, everybody please come and do some POCUS. It's going to be great. There's going to be loads of stuff to do. We're going to be doing everything from top to toe. So we're doing heads, eyes, lungs, ve vessels, abdomen, and of course, echo and TOE. So come mm -hmm. along. Looking forward to that. So. After these talks, we've allowed some time for discussion, so please don't be shy about adding um, comments to the chat box or questions to the Q&A. The boxes should be at the bottom of your screen, so please just add these in during the talks and then we'll discuss them all at the end. I think we're all quite used to um, digital presentations and digital events at the minute, but just a little reminder to everyone to keep their mics off or mics on mute, add your comments and questions. And now, without any further delay, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr Connolly. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, Sarah, can you just let me know if you can see that screen and the slides OK? I can indeed, yes. Brilliant. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, and I hope there are many of you joining us for this lunchtime webinar. And, and it's a real pleasure to be part of this. Thanks to Sarah and the team for uh, inviting me along to uh, talk to you about uh, some hints and tips for writing your abstracts. And, and as Sarah says, we are looking forward to receiving many of your abstracts into State of the Art 2022 this year. Um, and I've, in my research time, I've written lots of abstracts, uh, submitted to various conferences, and I've been able to review and, and supervise others. So I hope that there's some useful experience and advice uh, within these slides um, and also uh, in the Q&A that we'll have afterwards. Uh, and just picking up what Sarah said, uh, the submission date is the 27th of February. So um, get prepping and uh, don't, don't forget that date, have that in your diaries. Uh, and what I've got over the next couple of slides, and, and the slides will also be available afterwards as well, is just um, a, a summary of some hints and tips uh, and key things that I think are useful to be aware of um, when pre uh, preparing your abstract. So I think one of the first things to think about is just to have in mind the difference between a, an abstract that you're writing for conference, which is the state of the art 2022, um, compared to the abstract that you would present uh, or you would prepare for a manuscript publication, and they have very different purposes, often different styles and, and, and possibly different content. So the abstract that you prepare for a, a publication is very much a summary of the completed study and the completed data set that you're reporting in that publication. For a conference abstract, the, the emphasis is slightly different. You may have a complete data set that you're presenting, but you may also have preliminary data 
uh, or you may be presenting uh, the subgroup study from a larger uh, trial or a larger piece of work. And the aim of the conference abstract is really to engage us as the reviewers so that you can get your work forwarded on to present to us in a poster or an oral presentation in the conference itself. So the emphasis is on really selling the piece of work, selling the, the project that you've done, the data that you're presenting. It may still be ongoing, um, but really that's slightly different to how you put an abstract together for a publication. So keep that in mind. You want to use this abstract submission as an opportunity to showcase your work uh, and to move that forward to being accepted for uh, a poster or an oral presentation. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, also useful to, to have in mind is to know your conference and know the audience that you are going to be presenting to with this abstract and, and hopefully in due course your poster or oral presentation. So the state of the art, we welcome abstracts from all research disciplines and from all professionals. So that could be basic science, experimental medicine, uh, qualitative research, quantitative study designs of, of all types. But the, society, uh, the conference is, is very much a clinical meeting. Uh, it's really important that we have all of that breadth of content to present to our membership. Uh, but the emphasis is very much that it's a clinical meeting as opposed to a science specific conference or a methodology conference that you might attend. And so therefore the way in which you write your abstract also needs to target that conference and audience. So keep in mind that you want to make sure that your abstract gives a clinical message, that it's relevant to the audience. And remember that the reviewers who are looking at your abstracts, some of them may have content expertise in your area, some may not. And so it's important to make sure that for those who might be unfamiliar with this when they're reviewing the abstracts, that they can still get a clear sense of what you've done, why that was important for the critical care field, uh, what the key take home messages are and the impact that that can have uh, for our clinical practice. And one of the things that's really useful in this process to do is to ask other colleagues to have a look at your abstract. And they can be senior colleagues from within your specialty and within that the piece of work that you're, that you're doing. But it's also really useful to get someone from outside of the space to have a look and read your abstract. And we did this in our research group the other day. We had um, colleagues from science and clinical backgrounds, um, and we asked them each to be able to comment uh, and see whether or not they could understand and interpret the um, abstracts that other colleagues had written. So I think that's really useful benchmark to see whether or not your abstract is understandable uh, by other people from outside of your immediate specialist area. And then just thinking about the key content now, so make your title stand out. Um, so again, this is an opportunity to showcase your work. It doesn't need to necessarily be a very uh, detailed title. It just needs to stand out and be imaginative, be direct, be, be dynamic with what you're saying in the, in the title, because that can really help to uh, give the first impression of your abstract. It's the first thing that, that people will be reading. It can also help the reader, especially if they're not from your specialist area, to know what to expect in the content of the, of the main body of the abstract. So think carefully about making the title stand out. The introduction is then really important for setting the scene. You don't need to take uh, lots of space writing your introduction, two to three sentences, but make it relevant uh, and make it linked to the, the aim or the objective and the hypothesis that will follow. So it's really important to give the reader a sense of where is the background to this piece of work, to the study that you're presenting or the data that you're reporting. Why is this important? And to give them a real sense of what to kind of set, what to expect in the piece of work uh, and what the background is. So make that uh, concise and clear for the reader, uh, two to three sentences or so. And then that leads on to setting the scene for your aim or your objective or your hypothesis. And again, think carefully about writing that so that it's understandable to everybody who will read this. Make sure it's uh, objective and it's concise. Uh, and it's clearly phrased. It's really important because that will give people uh, a really good opportunity to know what it is that you planned to do within this piece of work. And so already they'll be thinking that they are with you on the page. They, they know what to expect when they're reading this uh, abstract. It's also important later on 
when you think back to your uh, to writing a conclusion that you can link back to the aim and objective and, and it all becomes part of, the, uh, of a, a complete piece of work. Then we think about the methods. Uh, really important, you know, don't overcomplicate these. They need to be factually correct, obviously. Um, you need to, to have robust methods that are uh, defendable, or that, that have clear rationale for the processes that you've undertaken um, and that they are appropriate methods for the piece of work that you're reporting and the, the type of study design that, that you've undertaken. Take care to make sure that they're logical and streamlined. So it's again making that point that not everybody who reads or reviews your abstract will necessarily have content expertise in this area, but they should be able to follow clearly what you've done. So often with the methods, it's worth kind of getting it all down on paper uh, and then actually working through to edit that and to streamline it down into the most appropriate uh, and necessary content that you need. Now, the results are uh, obviously you know, the crux of your abstract. This is the data that you want to, to present. Uh, and I've mentioned already that it might be that you have a fully complete data set that you're presenting. It might be that you're reporting a sub-study or a partial data set of preliminary findings for a study that's currently ongoing, where you may have the full data set by the time of the conference. And, and they're all, all equally acceptable options. But make sure you report the results in relation to the aim or the objective or the hypothesis that you have um, indicated already. Consider the headline findings. So one of the easy traps to fall into is feeling that you need to write absolutely everything, every piece of data that you've got into the results. Um, and sometimes that can be a bit overwhelming and it can make the results actually quite heavy and, and difficult to follow. So think carefully about the key data that you're presenting in your abstract remembering that, you, again, you want to showcase your study with a view that you will be selected then forwards for a poster or an oral presentation, and then you can go far greater into detail with the, with the results that you've got from, from all aspects of the study. So keep in mind the headline findings uh, that you want to report in the results, and that makes it easier for us reviewing um, to be able to see the, the impact of the study that you've done. And then thinking about the conclusion, you know, the really important thing with the conclusion is what's the take home message that you want the reader to leave with having looked at your abstract? What's the key piece of information? What's the key message that they should leave with? Again, thinking about this being a primarily clinical conference, uh, what's the clinical impact or the relevance for practice? Um, or how will this work lead on to potential uh, impact for clinical practice? And again, link that back to the aim and the objective. So that it's very clear that your conclusion is supported by the data that you've presented and is relevant to what you initially set out to do um, and to report in your abstract. So think clearly about that take home message that, that we should leave with after looking at your abstract. Uh, tables and figures. So these can be really valuable for including additional data or for making your data more easily uh, understandable or easily viewed by the reader. Think carefully again about using those judiciously. So sometimes things are, uh, sometimes data are better presented in text. Sometimes it's more uh, appropriate to report that in a table format and sometimes in a figure. And only you will know that depending on the, the actual data that you're presenting. But any tables and figures that you do have, make sure they are reported again clearly. And, and I've used the word clearly a lot, I know, but it's just really important to go back and look and see, do these figures and tables really show what you're wanting to, uh, what data you really want them to um, in that? Make sure they're uncluttered in terms of their presentation and their formatting, and that they are appropriately uh, entitled and have legends to explain any of the information within them. So they really need to complement the content of the written abstract. So it's worth thinking carefully about how you use those to best supplement the, the information that you're reporting um, in text style. And then finally, um, some of the, the kind of miscellaneous bits and pieces to do with abstracts. Um, you know, make sure that you do a spell check and a grammar check. And I know that sounds obvious, but, but so many of us uh, read abstracts and they haven't been. Remember that the, the reviewers for these abstracts will, will have maybe 50 to 60, possibly more. Uh, knowing how many abstracts get submitted to state of the art, we're, we're always inundated with abstracts. Um, and so when we read them, 
uh, it's really important that you think about the presentation, so spelling and grammar checking. Avoid abbreviations uh, unless it's absolutely necessary or they are really obvious abbreviations that, that we'll be familiar with. Again, I mentioned that point about people not necessarily having uh, content expertise. And so if you use uh, lots of abbreviations that may be hard for the reviewer to follow in terms of uh, keeping track, then, then just you know, go back and have a look and see whether or not that's essential to have as an abbreviation or would it be uh, easier to have that fully spelt out again. Think about using simple and concise phrasing. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the content is simple per se. I mean, the, the way you construct the sentences uh, short and concise is better than having really, really lengthy sentences. It's easier, again, when we're reading lots of different abstracts to be able to follow that. You don't have to include references in an abstract. Um, so that's a key thing that I think a lot of people often do is, is reference other papers and other studies. Again, you probably don't have the word count to do that, and it's not essential in an abstract. And then just finally picking up on that word count, use it appropriately. So, you know, if it's, if it's necessary and it's needed to use the word count to explain your methods or the data and the results and so forth, then, then use it. But often uh, you can have a very brief abstract that's still appropriately reporting all of the necessary content. So it's not about filling 500 words for the sake of it. It's about using the word count uh, appropriately and where necessary, but sometimes uh, shorter abstracts also contain all of the key information written in a really easy to understand and, and clear way. Uh, so I've uh, taken, I think, about rough, maybe about 10 minutes there just to highlight some of the key things that I think are important for uh, when you're preparing your abstracts. Um, I'm going to hand over now to, to Shagan to talk more about publication, and hopefully there'll be some questions and answers at the end, and we can pick up and expand uh, on any of the, the points that I've made here. Uh, so I'll stop there and, and hand over to Shagan. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Wanwan, for that excellent presentation. Um, and I'm going to carry on and just tell everybody, just let me just double check and make sure. Can you all hear me okay? Make sure I'm not muted. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'm just going to carry on from what Bronwyn has been talking about and talk about making the most of your poster. Um, of course, I've got lots of declarations of interest. The most important ones relevant to this is that I'm part of the organizing committee. Um, I'm part of the FUSIC committee, which means I'm going to be very interested in seeing things like your ultrasound ninja posters. And so I have a big conflict of interest, obviously, in wanting to see lots and lots of abstracts being submitted. Um, that said, I do think it's a worthwhile exercise. So the first thing I thought I'd say to everyone is for being here and just for having ideas and having that spark and wanting to submit a poster. And if you've already submitted a poster or an abstract, that is fantastic and you deserve congratulations. And just doing that is more than worthy enough. And that's just a brilliant thing to do. Um, when you submit your abstract or your poster, um, you actually get an instant publication because it goes on to the repository on the state of the art website, which you can see here, and you can view lots of the previously published abstracts. And you get an automatic publication in JIX because they all get uh, print, they all get paper slash PDF publication in JIX, and you can have that for austerity. So that's an instant publication and an instant, um, an instant win for your profile. But what if I told you there's more? You can actually do much more than that with your abstract. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd tell you this story from this, you know, well thumbed Charles Dickens classic, A Tale of Three Posters. And I thought I'd start with telling you the um, journey that three posters that were submitted to State of the Art all ended up in, and they all ended up doing slightly different things. So here's poster one. Um, this is the publication that came from the poster. So this was a, this was an abstract that was submitted to the State of the Art in December 2011 that ended up being published in Anesthesia in January 2014. And it looked at iatrogenic events prior to admission to ICU in a group of hospitals in the Thames Valley region. And it showed that there were quite a significant um, amount of iatrogenic events that happened prior to ICU admission and they may have impacted on mortality. Some of that data was presented locally to one of the hospitals, and that hospital had actually 51% of patients that had an iatrogenic event um, prior to ICU admission. And that data actually went back to the trust executive team and was used as part of the business case for the Avengers, I mean, uh, an outreach team. So they actually got 24-7 outreach in that hospital and the basis of data that was presented 
um, at the state of, at the state of the art poster. So that's one way that your poster and your research can impact locally. It doesn't just end at you shifting as at at you submitting your abstract and presenting it at state of the art. Here's a second story. So this was a very interesting abstract that was presented in 2016. Um, the idea came out of a meeting of minds on social media, funny enough, and people sat down together and came up with this idea of doing a local audit of um, central line insertion in a number of different hospitals using a platform that was developed in Wales. And this actually happened very successfully over a two week period. It was submitted as an abstract. Um, it was received very, it was received very well. It was encouraged to be published and it ended up being a publication in JIX. And this publication, this story, and this idea of doing this study of central line, com central line insertion and complications grew and grew to the point where this was actually became one of the submissions for the Royal College of Venetius National Audit Project 7. Sadly, it lost out very, very narrowly to cardiac arrest. However, it became adopted by the Intensive Care Society. And it is now that story and that post and that abstract has now become the first national audit in critical care. And this is going to be happening very soon hopefully later this year, where we will be doing a national audit, very similar to the national, um, the national audit projects run by the Royal College of Anesthetists, looking at all central lines inserted in um, pretty much every critical care unit over a brief period of time. So watch the space for updates on that. But that's how a poster can become a national research portfolio project. But you can go even further than that. So here's a poster that was submitted in 2016 um, by Adrian Wong and Laura Galata, looking at um, point of care ultrasound training in ICU, where they basically just emailed a whole bunch of people um, um, across Europe, asking them if they had standards, um, if they had established standards and established programs for training in point of care ultrasound. And the answer was, it was very variable. Some places had really big established programs, some places didn't. And so these also went to ask lots of questions. And this project got taken up by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and led to a round table discussion looking at point of care ultrasound competencies, not just across Europe, but across the world, including input from places like Canada and the United States. And not only that, that project even got, got even bigger and that has led to a final standard being published by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine on head to toe ultrasound and all with a Delphi consensus on what is considered basic ultrasound across intensive care practice. And so they've set out standards for what's considered basic neural ultrasound, cardiac, lung, et cetera, et cetera. And this is now possibly the biggest document that's ever been written on ultrasound standards in history, on, on ultrasound standards in, in intensive care in history. And this document will almost certainly be used as a basis for um, setting out ultrasound curricula and intensive care units in future. So those are three examples of how three different projects can deliver three different results, both lo locally, nationally, and internationally. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is we really want your stuff. We really want your research. We really want your stories because this is the kind of stuff that you can generate. Yes, we appreciate that just generating something that's local for yourself and a local win for you can be great. But don't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling, in the fabulous words of Tom Hardy from Inception. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. They were both excellent talks and have given me plenty to think about when I'm preparing my next abstract and also made me really, really excited for the upcoming State of the Art meeting. I always like to look at the different work that gets presented from different parts of the well the world really and um, I think it's fascinating to see what's going on everywhere. If anyone's got any questions or comments please do pop them into the Q&A or chat box. I was just wanted to ask a couple of um, questions that occurred to me while you were speaking. For events where you need to pre-record your work so provide like a video presentation and I know some of the categories for state of the art will require that for shortlisting do you have any tips for how people can best utilize this mode to give a really good account of their work but avoid any sort of faux pas I'm, I'm happy to maybe start I'm, I'm less familiar with the IT side of things or it's certainly less skilled in, in that sense but um I guess what I would recommend to people is, is have your abstract written out carefully as well. Like it's still worth preparing in detail what you're gonna be presenting on online um, or on your video. Uh, 
personally, I find it hard to kind of ad lib when it comes to things like that. So I think it's also worth structuring uh, the abstract. Um, you don't necessarily have to script it per se, but uh, sometimes you know, video abstracts can be uh, you know, a little bit more relaxed if they're not necessarily scripted, but it is helpful, I think, if you're unfamiliar or you're relatively new to submitting your abstract in that way, um, to still maybe have taken the time to write through it in the different sections so that you know the order of content that you need to deliver. Um, I think that's still useful because there will still be important pieces of information that you need to get through in your abstract. Um, and again, I think having that, that preparation is, is important. Um, that would be my, my tips. Thank you. There are some great um, technical tips actually that have, been, that have been released by a couple of friends of mine that are available on YouTube. So there's Tessa Davis, uh, very famously of Don't Forget the Bubble. She actually released a fantastic video that goes through the, um, how to record a video presentation and how to optimize things like your screen setup. Um, one of the big tips that she recommends is a ring light. You can buy a ring light um, on Amazon and you can just pop your ring light over your phone or over your computer. And that massively improves your lighting um, because it just gives you a single light source that comes down straight at you. And that's one way, that's one very simple thing that you can do just, just improve your lighting and improve your appearances when doing, it, when doing a presentation. Um, the other one um, there's a friend of mine called Nicholas Lim. He records some great video presentations as Pocus Club on YouTube. And he has some great recommendations when you're, if you want to put a video content in. So for people who are doing things like ultrasound ninja presentations, sometimes when you record video, um, it can, your, um, your ultrasound loops can appear very choppy, but there's some fantastic software on the internet that can actually smooth this out. Now I've completely forgotten, I've forgotten a complete blank as to what it's called, but if you look up his presentation, um, it tells you exactly what that software is called and tells you how to use it. So yeah, those are my two tips. Um, look up Tessa Davis and Nicholas Lim on YouTube and they will um, they will give you some great ideas as how, how to optimize your video from a technical standpoint. Excellent, thank you both. Um, I'm just wondering, so you, we've talked about quite a lot of the sort of do's and how to really present your work well. Are there any uh, red flags that you might note whenever you're reviewing abstracts or submissions, do you think, mm, no matter what else is said, this is already sort of putting me off? Neve's talked about some of this, but is there any other sort of major do nots as well as the do's? Uh, I think, again, I'm happy to maybe pick up and make a start. Um, I guess, you know, you know, you obviously don't don't report something that you, you haven't either done fully. I, I you can present preliminary data, but obviously, you know, you need to have done the work and <laughs> it might sound obvious, but, um, you know, make sure you can defend what the content of the abstract. I think if there's any doubt that the work has been carried out in a robust way um, or, or that, you know, there's any query around that that comes through. So I, I know that might sound obvious, but, um, you know, make sure that, that you, know, you are presenting work that you can uh, present authentically uh, and that you have uh, contributed to and, ha and have ownership of as well. So I think that's really important. Uh, and ways to, to kind of increase the rigor, you know, if, if your study has been registered somewhere, for example, if you're um, submitting findings to do with a systematic review, include the Prospero registration, if that's where you've registered the protocol, if it's, a, if it's to do with a, a trial or any other reporting checklist, you know, all of the, those kind of recommend, uh, recommendations around registration and things help us to to feel confident in the in the data that you're reporting, um, and and don't make I guess don't present data that you know that that you haven't got the you haven't done the methods or the, the data for if that you know so so make it you know, don't be reporting things that you haven't told us how you've done that um, so that, so that it's not clear um, and and likewise with the conclusions. Uh, don't draw a conclusion based on, on data that you haven't reported in the abstract. So, you know, it's all got to be linked to what you've presented in the content. Um, that would be my few things to avoid. Thank you. Right, so we've had a question come in. Um, what are the judges looking for for the awards? Now, that will vary depending on the categories, but broadly speaking, what, what are the judges looking for? Um, so I will talk about the area that I will probably be looking at and judging, which is the Ultrasound Ninja, for those who will be looking to present. So for that, we're looking for a really, really good story, a good innovative use of ultrasound, um, some really, really good, nice images, and a well put together presentation. 
so a lot of it is, I mean, as people, you know, it's a, it's a hackneyed phrase, content is king, and yes, content is king. So you want to have a really, really good backup and content. And then the way you put, you bring it all together with a slick presentation and, a, and you know, slick speaking and a good conclusion, that will, that will put you very highly, really high in the running for the prize of ultrasound imaging. I think it's really important with the other awards, you know, all of the information, I should just say, all of the information for those awards is on is on the website as well. So make sure you, you check in with that. We're looking for um, you know, good bodies of work, certainly with the, the things like the gold medal and, and awards of, of that nature, really looking for um, innovative and um, uh, well-conducted, robust programs of work um, and, and really want to see how that impacts the, the specialty of critical care and, and, and moves the field forwards. Um, so think very much around um, you know, how your work is, is informing our understanding, how it's informing clinical practice. Um, obviously there are other ones, the Cauldron and the, um, and the other awards as well. Again, just see what the themes are as well and be, and be sure about uh, that your work fits the remit too. So I think it's always, you know, whatever the, the um, the instructions are in terms of the specifics around each of the awards. Uh, we then look to make sure that they, they fit the remit um, and also then that, that there's a sufficient body of work that, that meets those. So I guess um, certainly some of the themes change each year for some of the, the programmes. So for example, the, the, the diaries or the MPT scheme, the cauldron, etc. Um, and then we, we look to see that they all fit into the remit of each of those. Um, really look, but think you know, about some of you will be presenting large bodies of work and, and, and putting forwards for some of the, the awards that we run. Um, and that's really important that we get a sense of the scale and the quality and the breadth of the work uh, and how that has really um, impacted uh, on practice. And also where you see that work leading to in the future. Um, I think that's also um, important when we're looking at some of the, the overall uh, awards in that sense. Great, thank you. It's been really interesting to see how those three different um, presentations have evolved and made a real difference. I'm just wondering if we could perhaps take, I suppose, a little step back. When I started training, I found it a little bit daunting to sort of figure out what can I do that would be interesting or worthwhile or useful. So perhaps for people maybe who don't have work to present this year, but are looking to come up with a really good project or something that they can do perhaps for next year's state of the art, but they're drawing a bit of a blank. Has anyone got any top tips or suggestions for how you can think of a project or a piece of work to do that will then lead to a good presentation for the future? I think one of my main pieces of advice is do something that you find interesting. Um, any project of whatever scale uh, is, is almost insurmountable if you don't have a particular passion or an interest for that. So um, I think that's one of the, you know, the real drivers behind wanting to do something for, for yourself and to improve the practice for our, and care for our patients is to do something that you're particularly interested in. Uh, and then also have a think about you know, what needs are, are, are present in, in the local workplace that you're in, you know, is there a particular gap in knowledge or a particular um, uh, skill that's missing or, or an area of practice that you think needs improving. So you know, keep keeping your mind open and talk to colleagues as well, get a sense of, of other things, you know, other projects that might have been done in the past that need revisiting or need progressing with um, and, and you know, have a look at and just see what what's going on in your immediate Field, as well as then keeping abreast more, more broadly about perhaps other uh, common aspects of critical care that are uh, topical at the moment to give you inspiration. Um, that's also helpful too. Uh, but I definitely think having a project that interests you and that you are passionate about will mean that you uh, feel happy investing the time and the energy and the motivation to, to see it through. Um. Mine is very simple. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So find a group. Um, there are loads of, certainly for trainees, um, there are loads of like research groups. So I'm sure people have heard of RAF, the um, Federation of, um, that's the Anesthetic Federation of, of Trainees and Research. And that's a huge kind of um, national research body. And they usually have interesting projects. Um, in loads of your region, they're probably local trainee um, 
um, consortiums type things of people just getting together doing research. So it's always good to get together with them. They've probably got a project ongoing that you can kind of get involved in. And they often have a list of projects going that you can get involved in. So that's a good thing to do. And don't just think in your own profession too, which is really, really great. I think we're seeing lots more um, collaborative, as Shane saying, work with colleagues, collaborative, multi-professional pieces of work. And actually, you know, when we think about so many aspects of, of our practice and, and how we care for patients, it's not necessarily working in silos. Some, some things are profession specific or, or might be relevant more to one profession than another, but actually bringing together people, clinicians from, from multiple backgrounds actually gives us some really interesting and, and valuable work. You must have just read my mind because I was just going to um, comment upon that and say that I think we're in such a, a great position in within intensive care that we get to work with so many people across the multidisciplinary team and it's been really nice whenever we see any projects that do uh, you know it's not just um, a medical or nursing it's a group um, any of the um, healthcare professionals or teams working with the patients so hopefully we'll see more of those this time around as well um, and we've been asked um, whether non-ICS uh, members can present and to the best of my knowledge anyone can enter any of these you don't have to be um, a member of the intensive care society although we would love to have you on board so do have a little look at our um, memberships because it's there's so many benefits to being a member so more the merrier definitely and hopefully you know if you're new to this and and, and you're kind of you know, presenting and submitting here for the first time we'd love to like as Sarah said for this to be an opportunity for you to get a sense of the of the intensive care society the the organization that it is what it offers members and how it can support our, our colleagues throughout the community in, in critical care so hopefully as Sarah says you know you'll submit your abstract you might start off as a non-member and by the time you, you leave the conference you'll have you'll have joined the society so that would be fantastic. I think my first um, poster presentation I've ever done as a doctor was at um, one of the ICS meetings quite a long time ago now but it was I would say I was a bit nervous about it because I didn't feel like you know I'm what am I going to do as a CT2 but everyone was so nice and so welcoming and it was really lovely just to get to chat to people get to show the work that I was really proud of and I've never looked back really it's mm -hmm. been great. Sarah, that's a really important point about different career stage as well. And, and I'm sure Shagan would say the same thing here that, you know, we welcome people from, from all different stages of careers. So you'll see that there are very early career stage. You don't have to necessarily be on a specific research path either. So don't be put off thinking that that's, that's only, you know, the only people that can submit abstract to those, you know, on a research path in their career. So we welcome people from all different stages and, and all um, aspects of being involved in, in work. And you'll also see very experienced and very senior researchers and clinicians presenting their work too. So please don't let that be a deterrent either. You know, we really support that. And, and, and we in fact welcome that. We like seeing people coming up through uh, and sharing what they've done. Absolutely. Um, so we've just had another question pop up about any tips on how to start writing your submission. So maybe you've already got the piece of work, you've finished doing the actual work, but just to get yourself started, because sometimes putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard can be a bit of a stumbling block, even though the work is already there and been completed. Shagan, do you want to kick off with that? Yeah, one? This, is, this is always a tricky one, because I, I get stuck in that fit as well. Um, I think one thing that helps me is just set aside time. Um, and I think that's the hardest thing to do because the thing for us to remember is that it's not, it's not a bad thing. We're all very busy people. We've got very busy lives, not just clinically, but also non-clinically. And so therefore it can feel almost overwhelming to kind of, to be able to, to, you know, spare another bit of time to do this extra thing. But a lot of it is actually just about starting. And what I find best to do is just, create a moment maybe half an hour 40 minutes and sit down um try and minimize distractions and just start with one word or start with one sentence and often if you kind of if you, the idea is often in your head and what i find is once i start once i've written the first sentence the rest of it usually follows and this is where of course having a team is actually very useful because once you've written 
once you've basically written your first bit and what I find best to do is actually the first time you write, just write, write actually too much. Um, just write lots and lots and lots, put all your ideas down. And then if you have a team, um, your team help you and they will edit it and, and they will help cut it down. There's often, and everybody's different, but I find it easier to edit once it's written than it is to write it in the first place. So that's, the, I think that's, that would be my suggestion. Um, just take some time, take a deep breath and start with, start with a word and see what happens afterwards. Completely agree. Like there's nothing worse than a blank page. Um, and, you know, you won't have the perfect version the first time you write it. So, you know, there's no point worrying about what that first draft looks like. It may look completely different by the time you submit it. There's, you know, the shaking, so don't be put off. Just get, get one word down and, and go for it. Everybody, everybody writes differently as well, though. So there's a, you know, this isn't the time or the place for lots of you know, different writing styles and different ways that we all do that. But like I say, ca carving out that bit of time is is really uh, just to get started. Absolutely, and I, I definitely concur. Once you've got something on the page, it is so much easier to keep going. But I think sometimes don't let perfect get in the way of good. Is my <laughs> what I try and remind myself things very few things in life are going to ever be perfect but getting them good is you know half the battle just get something down get started Fab. so i don't think we've had any more questions or comments come in we've just got a few minutes left so if anyone was hesitating or had something they wanted to ask or bring up do please use the last few minutes um, i think just again, a little reminder in case anyone missed the beginning, the deadline for abstract submission is on the 27th of February. So it's not too far away, but still got plenty of time. So again, don't be shy, get something down and um, get it submitted. I think we've got, I think I'll just um, highlight the um, the categories that we have for different um, abstracts and presentations. So we've got the um, Rising Star ICS Gold Medal, and that's um, awarded annually so that we can promote the best critical hair science within the UK. And it's awarded to a young investigator who's completed a substantial body of work. So that might be an MD or a PhD. If you haven't quite um, completed your PhD or MD, there is still a very good opportunity to present work with the e-posters and oral presentations. So this could be an audit could be a case presentation, it might be some research or some sort of innovative idea within critical care. There are a myriad of topics that you can present your work in and it'd be far too long for me to read them all out now. But if you check out the website, you can see ideas of um, where your piece of work might fit in. Um, I have a bit of a, a vested interest in the MDT diaries and the cauldron because these are both um, run by the trainee advisory group of which I'm a part. This year, the cauldron, we are asking you to describe your ideal training program. So from completing medical school to coming out with your ICM CCT. There have been some issues around training and we know that things can always be made better. There's definitely room for improvement and we would love to hear ideas for how things could be improved. It's a bit of a dragon's den style, but please don't be put off by that. It is still a very friendly and encouraging atmosphere, but there does have to be a little bit of questioning and probing into your ideas. Um, but do please have a little think about that. And um, we've got the MDT Diaries, which is also run by the TAG. And this year, we're looking for you to describe a day that has changed my um, practice. So it's a reflective piece that can come from absolutely anyone who works within ICM or has an interest in ICM. You don't have to be in a specific uh, profession to enter. The last couple of years, we've had some absolutely fabulous entries and I really enjoyed listening to them. I think they're brilliant. And I'm going to let Shagan talk a little bit about the ultrasound ninja because that is most definitely in his realm more than mine. Yep, so the ultrasound ninja is exactly what it describes on the tin. We want to hear your tales of awesomeness with the pro. We want to find out what kind of things that you've been doing and what kind of amazing diagnoses and amazing rescues that you've made using your, using your little friend, the ultrasound probe. 
And so this can take the form of anything. So um, it can be a tricky vascular access that you're able to solve. It can be a clever hemodynamic conundrum that you're able to figure out. It could be an un, it could be an unsurprising a surprising diagnosis that came out of nowhere um, because you decided to put the probe on the abdomen. Um, nonetheless, whatever it is, we want to hear from you. Um, we want to see your we want to see your awesome pictures. We want to hear your awesome tales. We want to give you a chance to showcase yourself and your unit and really, really shine and demonstrate your ultrasound skills. Um, without, we are accepting posters and your posters will be judged and the top posters will be invited to deliver a video presentation of their moments of awesomeness. So yes, please get them all in, Get um, get all, dig out all your, your famous cases from your logbook. You know that one thing that you saw that one time that you really wish that everybody was around to see? Yeah bring that out and submit it and we'd love to hear from you. Brilliant. I'm afraid that is coming to the end of the time. Thank you both for speaking. It's been absolutely brilliant and I've really enjoyed listening to your presentations and our discussion following. Thanks to everyone who's joined us. If you missed a bit or um, have anyone else who would like to, um, to catch up on this webinar, it will be available on the YouTube channel um, at the end of next week. So thank you all again and Hopefully we'll see you at State of the Art and get those abstracts in. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good luck.